Welcome back to Beyond the Boundary Road. I'm Jadine Croft and joining me is our language researcher, Des Crump. Hi, Des. Hi, Jadine. <laughs> thanks for joining us, Des. How are you? I'm good, thanks. That's good. So, so today, we'll be looking at how languages relating to family have evolved over the decades and how Indigenous Australians have adapted to these changes. So we'll start off first by just um, explaining how can language be represented when talking to family. Well, there's different um, ways of describing family and certainly in traditional times we had different words for the different people in the family which are a lot different to how we might describe those people in standard Australian English today. For example, in most Aboriginal cultures the, um, the mother's older sister was also seen as a mother and so they were given the name of mother as well and same as with the brother the um, the brother of the uh, the husband or the uh, the father he's also seen as a, a second father as well and then there's some interesting language words like gunijar for example which means grandmother it's also the word for for thumb in my language and it's also the word for big toe and i think part of that was um I guess reminding you how important your grandmother was and how indispensable and, and useful they were. So there's, there's those traditional sort of representations and then today there's a lot of, um, I guess, ways of adapting language and, and particularly Aboriginal English to describe our relationships or our, um, our cousins, for example, uh, in different ways. So what's the difference between um, language of your in-laws versus um, the standard fa family languages. Okay, well that's something that a few linguists have picked up as well, that there was a, a separate language called mother-in-law talk or, mm. or son-in-law talk. And because that was a taboo relationship where in a lot of communities where the Aboriginal son couldn't talk to the, um, the mother-in-law and they, in some places they weren't even allowed to be in the same space or the same room. And if they wanted to refer to their mother-in-law and, and talk about their mother-in-law, they had to use a special type of language. And then vice versa, if the mother-in-law was wanting to talk about her son-in-law, she had to provide words or, or language that was specific to, uh, to her or specific to that uh, son-in-law talk. Okay, so are you allowed to share the knowledge um, of what you've been taught to someone outside the community? and? If not, could this be the, the reason for the extension of some languages? Well, I think that sort of decision comes down to the community, how they want the language taught and who, who's going to be teaching it and who's going to be taught because some communities now, because they're going through that, that language revival, they're wanting to build up the language knowledge in their own community first and then they're going to take it out to the broader community to share it with them because they're wanting, I guess, their young people to learn it properly and feel confident themselves before they start, start bringing it to, out to the, the general public. Yeah, yeah, so Des, can you tell us what's the, what's the importance of silence at social gatherings? Well, that's something that often gets overlooked, I guess, in standard Australian English, because I guess in most English conversations, we don't have too many silences or, or pauses or anything like that. We, we tend to talk all the time, but mm -hmm. Aboriginal people, they they like to have that silence, that space where they can give themselves time to think or they don't, they don't want someone to rush in and make a decision. And, and I think that's important, particularly uh, with government agencies or, or schools or groups that are going out in communities and, and doing consultations. It's important to, I guess, acknowledge that silence and not just think because there's no answer that they must, there must be something wrong. It mm. it's, can mean that they're they're wanting time to have a think about what, what that person has said before they answer back. Or they might decide, well, we, we don't want to give you an answer yet, but we want to take it back to the rest of the community, sit down, have a, have a yarn with the community people, and then we'll come back in a week's time and then give you our answer then. Yeah. Can you describe for us the honorific system of um, First Nations people, like um, addressing older people as uncle or auntie? Yeah, well, that was certainly a, a sign of respect for uh, for old people within our community, and now it's it's I guess it's fairly well accepted, particularly by mainstream people, and and there's a lot of I guess use and recognition of elders in our community where they're being acknowledged as an auntie or as as an uncle, particularly during um, uh, ceremonies such as welcome to country or acknowledgement of country, and acknowledging their their presence as well as their their position within the uh, the community. Aboriginal communities, there's that respect for 
for those those blood uncles and, and blood aunties because they have a role in, in bringing up and nurturing um, a young person's development in the community as well. So, so I guess it's it's th there's those two sides to it within the Aboriginal community and families, but also the uh, the broader families and and community outside of that that group. Yeah, yeah. So just to finish off, in your language, can you tell us some of the words used to describe family? Okay. Well, I mentioned guni or, or gunija. Yeah. Uh, gunija is usually used for for grandmother. Uh, guni is used for, for mother, uh, baba for father, uh, dada for uh, grandfather, um, uh, dagan for brother, mm -hmm. uh, bawa for sister. They're the main ones that are used and, and it's, it's, it's um, often that you see Aboriginal people, particularly so from my group for example, uh, when we meeting people out out west, we'll we'll say, oh, yama garu, hello uncle, or or yama wolgan, hello auntie, yama dagan, hello brother. So so there's, I guess that that language is still still being used and and um, in in that everyday greetings and welcoming, particularly when you're talking about your own family or meeting your own family members or extended family. Yeah. So that's all we have for today. Thank you so much, Des, for being on the show. Oh, thanks again, Jaden. That's okay. So next week, we'll be looking at numeracy and the impact of Aboriginal languages on English. Don't go away. Beyond the Boundary Road will be back after this break. <laughs>